Over the last decade, probiotics have not just taken over our guts, but our minds as well. Not only have the sales of fermented foods like kimchi, kefir, and kombucha skyrocketed, but the probiotic industry as a whole is now worth over $50 billion. Today, we're going to be comparing the Rolls Royce of probiotics, VSL number three, which comes in at over 100 bucks for 30 capsules, to this, your favorite grocery store scam brand, Nature's Promise. Trust me, check the reviews. Today, we're going to investigate just how eating bacteria hit the mainstream, what the hell is even inside these pills, and finally, figure out if you actually need to be taking these souped-up supplements. Humanity has long been in cahoots with the microscopic world, even before humans were humans. We, like all other living creatures, likely evolved alongside the trillions of bacteria, virus, and fungi that actually make up 70% of all the cells on our body. Our ancient civilizations even utilized the power of these microbes long before they were even named or discovered. Over 10,000 years ago, our ancestors were using yeast to make bread, brew beer, and ferment vegetables using the naturally occurring bacteria to protect them from spoilage. 7,000 years later, in places like Egypt and China, people or even using the antimicrobial properties of moldy bread and vegetables to treat wounds. However, these microbes were not discovered until the 1670s when Antony von Leeuwenhoek finally observed them with his new invention, the microscope. This was followed by the development of germ theory in the 18th century, which then led to the intentional manipulation of microorganisms through processes like pasteurization, vaccination, and even showering. Although if you've ever been in a computer science class, you might wonder if some people ever got the memo. The concept of a probiotic didn't come about until the early 18th century, likely originating from Russian scientist Elie Meknikov, who was likely one of the first people to suggest that eating fermented foods like yogurt and sauerkraut could be very beneficial for your overall health. From there, interest in bacteria-filled foods only increased, with companies like Danon bringing yogurt to the mass market in the 1940s, and the health food movement kicking off in the 1980s bringing products like kombucha and kefir. It wasn't really until the 1990s that scientific research into probiotics really began, with research and regulatory bodies like the Food and Drug Administration finally looking into testing the safety and effect effectiveness of these supplements. Rapid growth meant by the 2010s, probiotics had hit the mainstream. Everyone and their mother, literally in the case of GT Kombucha's founder, started eating probiotics, making them a major player in American diets. This led to the popularity of probiotic supplements and eventually the development of products like VSL3. VSL number three is an extremely potent probiotic containing eight strands of lactic bacteria, all aimed at overcrowding the bad bacteria in the gut and working their magic. The 30 packets I ordered came in this comically large box, protecting the products 450 billion, I counted to make sure. All natural, live, freeze-dried bacteria. They're kosher and halal certified too. VSL number three and similar products have been researched to treat conditions like irritable bowel syndrome or IBS, ulcerative colitis, and extended antibiotic use. It's so potent that some doctors will even prescribe it as part of a treatment. So let's take a look through the microscope and peek at the microbes behind the magic. This dreamy constellation contains one strain of Streptococcus, three strains of Bifidobacterium, and four strains of Lactobacillus, along with cornstarch filler and silicon dioxide as an anti-clumping agent. As you can see, especially under phase contrast, these bacteria are alive and well, waking up from their freeze-dried slumber and beginning to jiggle about like my stomach after a trip to Taco Bell. The Streptococcus thermophilus, a related strain of the same bacteria that causes strep throat, is commonly used in traditional yogurt fermentation. It helps produce lactic acid, lowering the pH of the gut and preventing pathogens from growing. But most importantly for lactose intolerant people like myself, it produces lactase, an enzyme that breaks down lactose. This is why yogurt made with this bacteria is lactose-free and can be consumed by those who are dairy dysfunctional. The Bifidobacterium longum in VSL number three is one of the most dominant bacteria inside human guts helping us digest carbohydrates and fiber, producing short-chain fatty acids that also help protect the gut. This strain has also been shown to reduce the risk of respiratory infections. Bifidobacterium infantis, living up to its name, is naturally found in breastfed infants and is important for the overall health of the gut. It has also been shown to reduce inflammation and relieve symptoms like bloating and diarrhea. Last of the Bifidobacterium, we have Bifidobacterium brevae, known for breaking down complex carbohydrates and fermenting them into short-chain fatty acids, aiding with digestion and alleviating constipation. Next we have the five strains of Lactobacillus, one of the most famous bacteria strains in the world. Its variants provide us with lovely flavors you might find in sourdough and sour beers, as well as helping prevent the growth of Salmonella and E. coli. In VSL number three, Lactobacillus plantarum, Acetophilus, Delbarecki, and Paracase. Besides being used to make yogurts and prevent yeast infections, these strains of Lactobacillus can survive the stomach and gut's acidic environment and help you manage IBS symptoms like gas and bloating, digest lactose, and protect your gut lining, helping prevent leaky gut syndrome. 
This is the medical grade stuff, backed by research and refrigeration. You can see all these bacteria jiggling about, showing just how live and well this culture is. Their resistance to acidity allows them to survive the arduous journey through your stomach to the intestines, where they make the most impact. Now, keep this in mind when we look at the unrefrigerated grocery store probiotics. This Nature's Promise brand was 15 bucks for 50 capsules each one containing just 15 billion active cells, with a caveat that this count was made at the time of manufacturing. Amongst the constellation of maltodextrin, cellulose, calcium stearate, and silica is bacteria, seemingly just like the ones in VSL number three. Out of the four total strains in this supplement, each serving contains the same Streptococcus thermophilus, Lactobacillus acidophilus, and Lactobacillus bulgaricus. Bifidobacterium lactis is the fourth strain, and the only one not in VSL number three. This bacteria is also found in yogurts and metabolizes dietary fibers into short-chain fatty acids, boosting overall gut function. It seems the only promise this nature can make is some dead bacteria. You can clearly see the difference in movement and activity between the VSL number three and grocery store samples, despite the concentration being similar. However, not all the bacteria are dead, even though it looks like the majority of them are. These are the few that might actually make it to your gut and stay long enough to reproduce. They can activate immune cells, priming them to respond to pathogens, bind to your intestine lining, preventing undesirable bacteria from latching on and sticking around, as well as stimulate and feed the good bacteria that are already there. But obviously, the alive ones are significantly more potent. So as it turns out, there is a very good reason why these off-the-shelf probiotics label and count their bacteria before packaging because they start to die afterwards. VSL number three clearly states that it can only survive about two weeks outside of refrigeration before potency is affected. Knowing the modern supply chain and storage practices, I'm willing to bet that this bottle of Nature's Promise has been sitting around for a lot longer than that. As with any industry, the rapid surge in popularity of probiotics has brought a lot of folks looking to make a quick buck. We see this all the time with popular trends like detox diets, superfood supplements, and alkaline water. However, that doesn't mean that all trends are wrong. It's just that the research and regulations have not yet caught up to the market, and they probably won't for a very long time since it's notoriously difficult to study the links between food and human health. I actually took both of these probiotics independently to see if I found any benefits, but like many people, my microbiome is probably still pretty healthy, so the impact of any of these additional bacteria was likely minimal. I also regularly gobble up fermented foods like kimchi and kombucha. However, this does make me think about one of the hilarious traits of humanity, our susceptibility to messaging also known as propaganda in some circles. If we hear enough people saying that we should take probiotics, we probably will at some point. We're all sheep, myself included. Now, I'm not saying that taking these probiotics is a bad thing. I got baited into taking Athletic Greens daily and that stuff was like 80 bucks a month. So if you're thinking about spending your hard-earned cash on some probiotic, I would recommend thinking about if you actually need it. But if you do feel like your gut needs a boost or you just took a round of antibiotics, then medical grade is your best bet. It is extremely likely that all the bacteria that you might find in a grocery store supplement are dead. The labels saying active cultures are likely just a marketing gimmick designed to bamboozle you into buying their product. Thank you so much for joining me today on this episode of Not So Small. If you were taking a dump while watching this video, I hope it's going well. Let me know in the comments below if this has changed your mind on probiotics and if there's anything you want me to investigate next.